For Kroma Media's Policy, I'm Sane Lameni. TJ Stradom discusses his latest book titled Christo Visse, Risk and Riches. So this book is about one of South Africa's best known business giants, Christo Visse. Who is he and why is his story important? So he's a, he's a really an interesting figure. He's mm -hmm. been in, in the public eye for about 50 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, he started out uh, in his, uh, his cousin's business, or a guy who married his cousin, mm -hmm. um, and that was pep stores, mm -hmm. the early days of pep stores. Mm -hmm. So he started in that business around 1967 after, after he'd studied law at Stellenbosch. Mm -hmm. And um, initially he started out as number two in command and he, mm -hmm. he opened new stores because pep was growing like crazy at the time. It was, uh, it was the late 60s and, and the South African economy was growing quite mm -hmm. fast. And uh, a lot of retailers actually opened up in that time, and, and Pep was one of them. Mm -hmm. So uh, they were in an expansion phase, mm -hmm. and he was running around from this town to that town mm -hmm. to find sites for new shops. TJ, can you also tell us how his father played a crucial role in grooming him into a good businessman back in the day in Appington? So uh, about that part, I'm not very sure uh, how much how much of an influence he had so I took some of his uh, later inter interviews and he uh, in in that uh, he said well his father had uh, had the idea that you never take something from this from the shelf without writing it up mm -hmm. so uh, I mean and that's an, an important business mm -hmm. I think a business principle mm -hmm. that your, your own business can't be your piggy bank mm -hmm. your business is something where you have to con you have to conserve earnings and mm -hmm. take it into leaner years that mm -hmm. might be coming so um, yeah, it's quite interesting. He uh, uh, he says his father also also ran his uh, his own business uh, ever since christo has been a, like a, a young man, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, he saw some of those principles growing up. It was interesting to read at how he managed to grow the pep brand across the country. Can you tell us what were some of the business models that he used? So uh, there are different ways of describing it, but. Uh, mm -hmm. A very, a very, a very easy way would be stack them high, sell them cheap, mm. and uh, a, a very, I mean, a low-cost business model, not much frills, mm. but at the time, new marketing techniques. Um, they had very aggressive advertising campaigns, and and, and um, they had a they had a footprint that mm. went to places where some of the other retailers wouldn't go, mm. and I think that was definitely part of the success. Um, and one of the things that uh, that came out in uh, in some of the inf interviews and, and, and some of the some of the media study that I did about uh, Visa is um, Pep at the time didn't and, and South Africa was a different place back then. Mm. So there were segregated uh, dressing rooms okay. in retailers. Yeah. So Pep at the time didn't segregate, mm. which I think is an incredibly uh, it's an incredibly bold move at the time, mm. um, but also a logical move mm. because. Uh, Obviously, if you treat your customers well, yeah. they will treat you well, mm. or they'll be they'll come back to you. Mm. Yeah. And then low prices uh, coupled with that. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I, th I think what's what's interesting is is some, uh, many of the businesses that he's been involved with over the years mm. have had this low low cost model mm -hmm. um, with some com complexity in the background in terms of the way they source. In terms of uh, the distribution systems, mm. um, but a low-cost model in uh, in how you and how you get the the, the, uh, the product to the to the client, mm. and that's true of pep stores, that's true of Ackermans mm -hmm. to some extent. Yeah. It's definitely true of Shoprite, mm. and um, I think over the years he's employed very good managers in many of these businesses. Mm. Yeah. It was also interesting to note that the store was on a cash basis instead of credit. Can you elaborate on that? No, I think it's very interesting. And, and uh, at the time, and, and this is maybe also more still some of the, some of the business philosophy of, uh, of his cousin Renier van der who started the business, mm -hmm. is um, people get into trouble when they buy on, uh, on credit. Yeah. And, it, it, and it happened with some of the other retailers at the time. Mm -hmm. Um, there are plenty of examples where the, the established in retailers at the time sold on, on account and they had these big books and uh, well, firstly it, it was exclusive in a way because uh, to get an account in those days mm. was something that 
you would need to prove a lot of things. Mm. And I think for many black and uh, South Africans, that was very difficult. Um, and, uh, and, 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 in, and in another sense, it also, it, also, uh, it, it also sort of forced the business to then uh, manage its own cash in a different mm. way, which might not be the ideal model. Mm. So with PEP, they sold cash, mm. which, means, which meant they had cash. Mm. To, to then to then buy their own stock with that, mm -hmm. and um, I think that was an important differentiator also for them mm -hmm. in the in the 60s, the 70s. Mm -hmm. The 70s they were an incredible success. Yeah. Um, so maybe just to, just to, by by 1972, Pep stores listed on the JSE, mm -hmm. and uh, <laughs> shortly after that, Christovisa left the business for a while mm -hmm. and went into uh, well to practice law, uh, to politics. Mm -hmm. um, and then he came back in the early 1980s, mm. and that's when he took control of the business, mm. and that's how he, even that's that's actually why he is the legendary business figure that we know today, mm. is because of what happened from then onwards. Mm. Fifty years of risk taking in the business world paid off until he overplayed his hand with furniture group Steinhoff and lost a huge part of his fortune. Can you briefly tell us how this happened? So, uh, what's interesting is, is Christo was in control of. Pepcor, which uh, had pep stores mm -hmm. in in its stable uh, uh, and Ackermans and, and and other things, mm -hmm. um, at that time uh, earlier on it was a much bigger group which which also controlled uh, Shoprite at the time, mm -hmm. but uh, by the time he sold Pepcor to Steinhoff uh, in around 2014 2015, mm -hmm. that was what Pepcor was, and um, he uh, in, in in effect it was a it was an exchange of shares, so he. He was paid in Steinhoff shares for Pepcor. Pepcor bought Steinhoff, but paid him in shares, so that made him uh, the largest shareholder mm -hmm. in Steinhoff and also the controlling uh, uh, controlling force in that company. Mm -hmm. um, but and this is th these are things that we're only learning now mm -hmm. uh, with PwC's mm -hmm. report about Steinhoff mm -hmm. that have come out, and uh, though it's not public, mm -hmm. there are certain things that are clear uh, in the summaries that we've seen. Mm -hmm. Is uh, there was an, an inflation of, of profits and um, uh, income for many years. Mm. Assets were overvalued, and this, in effect, uh, meant that when Visa bought into Steinhoff by selling Pepcor to the company, mm. he bought something that that really wasn't there. Whereas it looked as if Steinhoff was this gro global retailer mm. uh, um, with the world at its feet, mm. but in effect there was a lot of debt that was masked by clever accounting and uh, the company <laughs> itself uh, talks, uh, talks about accounting irregularities mm. and it now seems that uh, um, several of the executives, senior executives were involved mm. in, in that manipulation of the books mm. allegedly. So after losing that 59 billion rand, he said he was lucky because it happened a year later. It could have been worse. Why does he consider himself lucky? So the thing is, he he's also he also controls Shoprite, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I mean we all know that Shoprite is is a seriously big company. It's a very successful retailer. It's the biggest grocer in the country, and and it also has a earns almost a fifth of its of its profits from outside South Africa, so mm -hmm. it's also geographically diversified to some extent. Mm -hmm. um, and ShopRite is an amazing asset that that he's controlled since uh, yeah since the early 80s, mm -hmm. and um, it has grown. But the the, the reason he, he has said he counts himself lucky is mm -hmm. because he was on his way to sell ShopRite to Steinhoff too. Mm -hmm. um, or sell is, is maybe a, 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 a an oversimplification, but to to put the to, to put the businesses together mm -hmm. in a way that would give Steinhoff control of uh, of Shoprite, mm -hmm. and had that happened before before the, um, before the accounting irregularities mm -hmm. became apparent and before the, the the former CEO of Steinhoff resigned, then in effect that asset would have been trapped in the same Steinhoff that we see today. Mm -hmm. Steinhoff is selling assets mm -hmm. because it, uh, it wants to fill the hole that's been left there by, by, by the accounting irregularities and the, and the large debts that's been uncovered and the, the inflation of profits. Mm -hmm. So that's why he counts himself lucky because mm -hmm. his, his biggest other asset could have been in there mm -hmm. with it and then you can't get it out.
Can you tell us how he managed to take advantage of what you refer to as Mbegi Bumiers to expand his business? So what's interesting is uh, in, in Mbegi years, mm. everyone benefited. Mm. Almost every, everyone in business mm. benefited because South Africa's economy was going by more than 4%. And, and today it sounds like a staggering number, but then it sort of became commonplace. Mm. And um, a lot of a lot of the uh, a lot of the, a lot of that growth was fueled by consumer spending. Mm. So, pep stores benefited, um, and several other of the retailers. Mm. I mean, Shoprite is not only exposed to the lower income groups; it also yeah. has some exposure yeah. to the middle income groups mm. through through checkers mm. um, and through the furniture chains and and, and uh, OK Furniture, mm. House and Home. Mm. Those places benefited quite a lot from from the Mbeki boom years mm. because. People started furnishing their homes. Mm. People were feeling flush and happy, mm. and they were they were keen to buy. Mm. And uh, I think that uh, when that optimism faded uh, with with the financial crisis and the recession that followed it, mm. a lot of South Africa's furniture retail space was decimated by it. It, it took a few years to take effect, but uh, the likes of uh, the JD Group, um, Ellerines, mm. I mean, they struggled to. To adapt to the to the new reality when growth wasn't that that heavy uh, that quick anymore, and mm -hmm. South Africans weren't willing to buy furniture on credit. Mm -hmm. So, furniture might be one example. But uh, if you were in retail mm -hmm. between 2000 and 2008, in almost whatever capacity, uh, you would have done well, and, and and you can see it from from all the retail companies. And what's interesting is uh, at the same time, Shoprite which uh, Visa was involved with, was also benefited from an expansion into the rest of Africa. Mm. And uh, I mean, that helped to, to a great extent because suddenly there was this commodities boom mm. and uh, the, you know, the, 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 the Far East were buying African commodities, which, which bumped up growth quite a bit. And, and to get formal, formal retail to some of those locations was, an, was also an, a very, very good feat. Mm. And at the same time, uh, maybe from from a, from a decade or two earlier, mm. um, some of the investments they made in Eastern Europe were also starting to pay off. And mm. the only thing that didn't really come off uh, for Visa in the, in the early 2000s was uh, his uh, his foray into in, into British retail, because the British high street is a difficult thing, it's a difficult thing to predict and a difficult thing to understand. A very competitive environment. So they tried to take the PEP model to Britain. And it just didn't really stick there. Was there a time when he made bad business decisions, and how did he manage to work on fixing those? See, so it's 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 a it's interesting to now afterwards say that it was a bad decision at the mm. time because mm. you don't know. Yeah. And we we know of his successes. We know quite a lot. How he, him and Whitey Basson bought OK for for one rand from from SAB back mm. in the day and. Yeah and how they took over checkers and turned around a loss-making business in a, in, a, in a short, quite a short time. Um, so bad decisions is, is a difficult thing to say, but, but let me rather put it this way. Mm. Um, over a long period, he's shown that he's willing to take risks, mm -hmm. and it's risks that's, that, that some other people might not have been willing to take. So in the 1990s, he built up a banking empire, mm -hmm. and uh, what initially started as a as a single bank, Borland Bank in the day, uh, he he then merged with uh, with NBS, which was an Natal building society, and then folded the whole thing into uh, Board of Executives (BOE), and it became this big uh, this big banking empire. Mm -hmm. And the funny thing is, had he stuck with the people he had in Borland Bank mm -hmm. and the um, the management expertise and and the business model they developed by the end of uh, end of the 1990s, um, he would have in effect had something very similar to what Capitec is today, and uh, to me that's interesting. So he he wanted to grow the business in a in a different way, uh, and, and and maybe didn't didn't stick to the basics in that sense, and uh, they were incredibly innovative uh, managers in that business. Now why things fell apart and why why the, the, they they maybe didn't reach their full potential in that business? I, I mean, that's in the book. I, I reckon go and read it. Mm -hmm. And lastly, what else would the readers be getting from this book without you giving too much? I think they'll get a, a so readers from reading it. I think we'll get a, a sort of a an overview 
of the South African economy and the, and the retail space mm. and how difficult it was to do business in the 1980s. Mm. Um, how many opportunities came in the 1990s mm. um, because of the long years of isolation and then because of the world opening up and, mm. and, uh, and, and optimism in South Africa and, mm. and uh, the same for the 2000s. And then again with, with uh, the kind of risks that came when, when business people started started becoming more aware of the dangers of mm. uh, possibility of state capture mm. and uh, I mean uh, corruption that, that, that made it difficult to mm. function in uh, at, at, as a business in South Africa. Mm. So all in all, I'll give you a few good stories in that book, mm. things that you'll think, ah, oh, this guy did this. Mm. And uh, I'll give you a decent overview of, uh, of the South African economy mm. and then why this guy is a big deal. That was TJ Stradom speaking to Polity about his book titled Christo Visse, Risk and Riches.